Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander. Episode 48, Three Kings, One Crown. As we hinted at when Antiochus II died in episode 45, the political world he left behind him was an uncertain one. In today's episode, we'll begin exploring the fallout from his death and introduce the new ruling players to the stage. As such, we'll technically see three kings claim power in just two years, including the infant son of Antiochus II and Berenike, who my sources have indicated was anywhere between two and five years old. An alternative title for this episode might be Antiochus the Unfortunate, because, as we'll see, the boy's life and rule will not be the longest and most prosperous. Now, we haven't come across the concept of three simultaneous rulers before, even if the concept doesn't fully hold up, as we'll see in this episode. There are some parallels in the form of Constantine IV of the Roman Empire and his brothers Heraclius and Tiberius, who ruled together as a trio until 681 CE. Constantine had become co-emperor with his father Constans II in 654, and the younger brothers were also acclaimed in 659. Constantine tried to remove them in about 672, but the army protested, saying that there should be three emperors as there were three figures of the Trinity who governed the universe. Constantine backed down, but he kept his brothers close, and in 681 he slit their noses and they were removed from power. This kind of thing was often used to stop claimants to the throne pressing their claims. The point being here that the three sons of Antiochus II are either pressing their claims now or will do before too long. These three people, as a reminder, are Seleucus II, Hyrax, and Antiochus the Younger. We're going to see Seleucus II and Antiochus the Younger both being put forward as kings the minute Antiochus II dies, and Hyrax will enter our stage the following year. For the purposes of this episode, I'm going to describe both series of events here, which happen in 246 and 245 BCE. We'll then focus on the politics of what happened in this episode in next episode. The point of what we're talking about today is to show how chaotic the period just after the death of Antiochus II is. You can say goodbye to the smooth transition of power Antiochus II himself experienced in 261 BCE. It's a new world now. The two adults we're going to focus on are Seleucus and Antiochus Hyrax, the sons of Antiochus II and Laodice I. So, let's introduce them to our Hellenistic stage. Seleucus, referred to from here on out as Seleucus II, was born in July or August of 265 BCE, making him either 18 or 19 in July 246 BCE. Wikipedia doesn't have a birth date for Antiochus Hyrax, who I'm going to refer to by this common epithet to avoid confusion with his half-brother. However, it states he was 13 years old when his father died, which would place his birth at around 259 BCE. Bevan notes that Antiochus was labelled as 14 years old in 240 by Justinus, placing his birth in 254 rather than 259. However, I'm going to go with the date of 259 BCE, making him about 6 years younger than his brother. To place this in the context of our previous episodes, Seleucus II would have been born about a year after the death of his uncle and namesake, Seleucus the Young King. Antiochus Hyrax would have been born after the death of his grandfather Antiochus I, and in the year the Second Syrian War started in our narrative. So, let's recap who exactly we're dealing with, as there have been a lot of names flying about of late, most of them admittedly being Antiochus. The people we're going to be discussing are, for today's purposes, called Seleucus II, Hyrax, and Antiochus the Younger, now about 19, 13, and 2 to 5 years old, respectively. The mothers of these three boys and men are Laodike I, the first wife of the old king, and Berenike, his second wife. When their father died, Seleucus II and Hyrax were in Ephesus, in Anatolia, with their mother, while Berenike and Antiochus the Younger were in Antioch. Seleucus II was proclaimed king by his mother, and Berenike declared her son Antiochus the Younger as king and herself as his regent. Antiochus the Younger was recognised in Antioch, Seleucia, and possibly the cities of Syria. 
It's at this point, after we've seen two of the sons are claimed as king, that I'm going to briefly talk about Antiochus Hyrax, as he will claim to be king in later years, but doesn't show up yet at this point in our story. We'll deal with him more comprehensively in a later episode, but the point is just to introduce that all three sons claim the crown, and emphasise the chaos of the period following Antiochus II's death. Hyrax became a monarch himself in Sardis, and the majority of my sources say he was the active party, rather than being proclaimed by someone else. To quickly summarise from Justinus, Seleucus II would ask his brother for help after losing a battle to Ptolemy III in the near future of our narrative. He would give Hyrax control over everything west of the Taurus Mountains in return. However, the 14-year-old Hyrax wanted the whole empire, and would go to war against his brother. The chronology I've got would therefore place his rebellion in 245 BCE, so in the future from our point of view, and Hyrax would basically declare himself independent. So, technically, there were three kings in the Seleucid Empire across only two years, hence the title of today's episode. As a recap, as we covered in episode 45, there's disagreement about whether Laodike I poisoned Antiochus II, or whether he died of natural causes. Granger comes down on the side of natural causes, popular sources advocate poison, and Bevan doesn't really commit to either side as to whether she'd done the deed, or if it was just perceived to be the case. Justinus makes no comment about it either. Speaking of deaths which the sources don't agree about, it's time to say goodbye to Antiochus the Younger. As I said at the start of our episode, you can think of the title of this episode as Antiochus the Unfortunate if you want as it's the last we're going to hear of Berenike's son. I've seen different accounts for what happened, so I'm going to list what I've seen, and then come to my own conclusion. One version has it that those loyal to Laodike killed Antiochus the Younger at the end of the summer of 246 BCE. Alternatively, Laodike I herself killed both Berenike Syra and Antiochus the Younger, which may have been in retaliation or to stop intra-imperial conflict. As a quick note, if it's this version of events, the latter aim doesn't really work out with these actions, because Seleucus II and Antiochus Hyrax will be fighting amongst themselves for the next 17 years. Alternatively again, Justinus places both deaths at the feet of Seleucus II, with his mother merely egging him on. I've also seen a version whereby Laodike bumped off her husband Antiochus II, but followers loyal to her ended the lives of her husband's second wife and her son. Bevan's 1902 work paints a more elaborate picture. He notes that Laodike needed to act fast against her rival for the sake of her survival. I'll go into the political situation for the two women more in next episode, so that sentence will make more sense in the near future. Anyway, Laodike kidnapped Antiochus the Younger, but Berenike found out which house he was believed to have been taken to and headed straight for it. People gathered at the entrance to the house, but were dispelled by Berenike's approach. Sometime later, when it wasn't clear if her son was alive or dead, Berenike played into the pro-Berenike feeling in the city of Antioch, and the people keeping her son were therefore forced to act. They brought a child out and labelled him as being Antiochus. These people were powerful enough to avoid giving this child up to Berenike. However, they were forced to make a deal with her whereby she and a guard of Galatians were allowed to take up residence in an area of the palace in an area called Daphne, which could easily be defended. For the final events of this story, I'm going to turn to Granger's account. According to this version of events, Laodike supposedly sent word out to the high and mighty of Antioch, and two men by the names of Ganaios and Icardion answered the call, murdering Antiochus the Unfortunate. In the meantime, Berenike's bodyguards from Galatia killed her. According to Justinus, Berenike holed herself up at Daphne when she knew her assassins were coming for her. Her brother, Ptolemy III, sent help north, but he was too late, as she was betrayed and killed. The version of events that I'm therefore probably going to go with is that Antiochus the Younger was kidnapped and killed, but that the events Granger lays out of Berenike trying to intervene and being killed by her Galatian bodyguards also happened, as well as the murder taking place at Daphne. It also probably doesn't really matter whether it was Laodike or Seleucus who ordered the deed. Antiochus the Younger was anywhere between two and five years old, and had nominally held the crown for just under a year. However, while this is the short version of events, it isn't the full story. What exactly was going on behind the scenes? 
In the next episode, we will dive into what exactly Laodike and Berenike were doing, following the story from both their perspectives from the moment Antiochus II died. We'll also see what the political reality exactly was, and what any of this has to do with Ptolemy III of Egypt and the looming Third Syrian War. Until then, thank you all for listening. Feel free to get in touch with the show's email address for any questions, comments, or topic suggestions for future Tangent episodes. Until next time, have a great week, everyone.